Hello there, I'm Thundaga, and welcome to my How to Make a Pokemon Game tutorial series. This series will cover all of the essential info that you need to make a Pokemon game in RPG Maker and Pokemon Essentials. In this episode, we'll be looking at event commands. We'll be doing an overview on each and every command that you can use in your game's events. That's right, all of them. We'll look at the three event command pages and break down how each and every event command can be used. We'll also discuss how frequently some of them should be used, because to be honest, some of these are commands that I use very often, and some of them are commands that I've never used at all. Also worth noting, some of these commands have some more complex use cases, and we can dive a little bit deeper into those in their own future tutorial episodes. For now, the plan is an introduction to each and every event command. With all that said, let's get into it! So, as a reminder, to access our events, first make sure you're working on the event layer. To do this, look up in the top left corner of the screen here and select the blue cube to the right of the three mapping layer icons. Now that we're working on the event layer, we can right click on any existing events and select edit event, or we can right click on an empty space and select new event to open our event editor window. I recommend that you get very familiar with the event window since this is where we'll be spending a lot of time making our events. In fact, most tutorials moving forward will probably use events. For more information on all the different sections of this event window, I would recommend checking out my previous tutorial where I do a deep dive on each and every section. For this tutorial though, we'll be focusing solely on the event commands section of the window right here. This is where we can add a sequence of commands that will run in order from top to bottom once our event is triggered. Some events can seem pretty long and intimidating with their list of commands, but once you get familiar with all the event commands, you'll be reading this screen like a pro in no time. Plus, I promise you that event commands are so much fun to work with. They're the key to bringing functionality and life to your game. To begin adding an event command to our list here, simply right click and then press enter on your keyboard or select insert to open the event commands window. In the event commands window here, we have three pages of event commands that we can choose from. Now, this can be intimidating as well, but don't worry, there are a ton of commands that we never use. There are some in here that we use a ton, and there are also some others that get used occasionally, and you'll learn in time as you get more familiar with all of the commands. But have no fear, because we're going to be looking at every command on all three of the event command pages here in this tutorial. And luckily for us, the very first command on the first page of our event commands list is also probably the most frequently used of all the commands, and that's show text. Show text is super straightforward in that it does exactly what it says it does. It shows a text box with some text in it in our game when our event is triggered. Selecting the show text command here will open a text box where we can type in any message that we want to appear in our game. So for example, we can type in a fun little message here like, hello. I'm an event. And then when we're done, we click OK. I want to test this out in game, so real quickly, I'll add a graphic to our event so it's an NPC that we can talk to for testing. Let's go with this old guy here. When our event is triggered, this just opens a text box with the text that we just typed out. So there it is. There's our old guy saying, hello, I'm an event. There are some more advanced text things that we could cover here, but I'll save those for a later tutorial. If you do want to get ahead though, as some homework, I would recommend that you look into text commands. I'll link a list of them in the description, so check those out if you're feeling adventurous. As a small taste of what I'm talking about, if you type slash B in front of your text, it can make all the text afterwards turn blue, and if you type slash R, it can make all the text afterwards turn red. There are so many more text commands though, and it really deserves its own full tutorial. Before we look into the next event command though, I think now is a good time to bring up a couple event command window pro tips. As I mentioned earlier, the event commands are a sequence of commands that run in order from top to bottom. This means the order of our commands matters a ton. So for example, if we have two show text commands here, we'll see the first text box or the one on top of the list first when we talk to our event, and then after we hit enter to close that text box, the second text box will appear. Whenever I want to change the order of my event commands, I use copy and paste. At any time, you can select an event command, and then press Ctrl C to copy it. From there, you can left click on the event command that you want your copied command to appear on top of, and then press Ctrl V to paste it, and it'll paste on top. We can then go back down and click on the original event that we copied, and then press the delete key to delete it. And there we go, we changed the order of our event commands. If you want, you can also instead just right click on any event command and see the full list of available options here. And then we could probably just go with cut and then paste because that's probably easier after all. 
You can also select multiple event commands at once. If you click on an event command, and then hold down the shift key, and click on another event command, you'll select both commands as well as all the commands in between. This is super useful for selecting and then copying large chunks of event commands. As an example, let's copy and paste both of these. So look at that, now we have a ton of event commands in our list. What we can do is click here, and then hold down shift, and then click here, and look at that, we've selected those two event commands as well as everything in between. This is super useful and I use this a ton. At any time, if you press Ctrl A, you'll select all the commands in the list, which can also be useful if you want to copy an entire list of commands over to another event, or if at any time you want to delete. At any time, you can also right-click on an existing event command and select Edit to change the values set in that command. I use this a ton in just about all of my event commands, so you should get used to editing yours as well. As one final pro tip before we move on, if you right click and then select Batch Text Entry, it'll open this tall text window that will accept a lot of text input, and then from there it will automatically split those lines up into a bunch of different show text commands. So what I've done here is just written in a bunch of example text. What we can do here is now hit OK, and look at that! It split all of those lines into a bunch of their own different show text commands based on every four lines. And then this one just was the two left over at the very end. This is particularly useful if you've written down a long monologue elsewhere, and then you want to transfer it into your game. Just be mindful that the text still flows naturally in your game. Alright, now that was a lot of info about show text and a bunch of different event command pro tips. What do you say we delete all of these examples, and let's look at the next event command in our list. Let's look at show choices. What Show Choices does is open a window for the player to select from a list of choices, and then the event branches down different paths and runs different event commands based on the choice that the player selects. Let's create an example of Show Choices right now. So, after selecting the event command, we'll see here on the left are our list of choices, choice 1, 2, 3, and 4. And on the right is what happens if we press the Cancel button. If we select Disallow, the player cannot press Cancel to leave the Choice window. They must make a choice. For the other choices though, these choices will be automatically chosen if the player presses the Cancel button. So for example, if we select Choice 2 here, then Choice 2 will be selected when we press Cancel. So in this case, no. The final option here, Branch, means it will be a separate option apart from Choice 1, 2, 3, or 4. For the purpose of this example, let's select Branch. Now what we can do is also plug in some text for our choices. You can see it defaults to yes and no, but what we could do is change this to say something along the lines of sure, no way, and then let's plug in something funny for 3 and 4, like heck yeah, and I don't know. And there you go, we have a show choices window here that will have four options. If you ever want to make an event with less choices, just leave those text fields empty. So for example, if we cleared out choice 4, then our event would only have three choices. Let's press OK and take a look at this event command in the event command window. So one thing you'll see here is that there's actually four different branches depending on the four different choices, and there's a fifth one here at the bottom for when cancel. This is our branch option. So if we select sure, let's just say to show text that says you selected sure. Then we hit OK here, and then bada boom. What we can do is copy and paste this, and for no way, he'll say, you selected no way. Paste this in again, you selected, heck yeah. You selected, I don't know. <laughs> this is such a goofy example, but I hope that this all makes sense. When we hit cancel, he'll say something along the lines of you, Selected nothing? You pressed cancel instead. What the heck? And there we go. Now, let's also, well, we can keep this here. Let's actually change this text here. So instead of saying hello, I'm event, he'll say, hello, make a choice. There we go. So now what we've got here is an event where when you talk to him, he'll say, hello, make a choice and then four options will appear in a window. They'll say sure, no way, heck yeah, and I don't know. So let's press OK and let's test this out. All right, so here's our old dude, let's talk to him. He'll say hello, make a choice, and look, it's the text options that we set up in our show choices. Sure, no way, heck yeah, and I don't know. 
Let's select I don't know. You'll say, you selected I don't know. Now let's actually select sure. So this is very useful. I referred to it as branching before, but essentially what this is doing is allowing our event to run different sequences of event commands based on choices we've made earlier. This is really powerful and very useful. I love using show choices. And as the kicker, let's press escape or cancel to make no selection. He'll say, you, you selected nothing. You pressed cancel instead, what the heck? That's because we set this up with a branch. That's pretty dope. And as a pro tip for show choices, as of Essentials V20, you can actually stack show choice events on top of each other to expand the list of choices. So let's just add another one right here, and let's just plug in some basic show choice text here, like one, two, three, and four, and then we'll actually see both the four original choices and these four extra choices together in one long list of choices. We'll, we'll have a show choices here with eight options. That's a lot of options, but let's press play and get into our game and see it. And would you look at that? We have sure, no way, heck yeah, I don't know, and then one, two, three, four as well. It's really powerful to be able to stack eight choices. And if we wanted to, we could even get crazier and stack it and have 12 if we wanted to go bonkers. But you know what? I think that's about it for show choices now. Show choices is extremely powerful and I use it a lot. All right, hopefully that wasn't too complicated. Let's move on to the next event command. Let's look at input number. Input number opens up a little window where you can move up and down or left and right to input a number and save that to a variable. Let's add one to our event real quick right here. So we select input number and what we can do is see that there are two values here. The first is the variable for our number to be saved to. So let's just go in and actually let's create a new variable. We don't want to use any of them on the first page because these are used by a lot of other stuff in Pokemon Essentials. So just to be safe, let's go to like variable 51 here and let's call this input number. If I could type, there we go, input number. The next we can select how many digits we want to allow. So let's do three digits. Then we could just hit okay. And now let's test this out in game. So when we talk to our old dude here, he'll say, hello, I'm an event. And then afterwards, we'll be able to see our input number. And here are our three digits. We can go left and right. We can go up and down on these. So let's just set this to like two, three, five. Then if we hit enter, there we go. What this will now have done is set variable 51 to 235. As a refresher, what we can do is open up our debug menu by pressing F9 and go into field options, then go down to variables. And then we can scroll down to variable 51. If we want to scroll faster, we can press the S key on the keyboard to go down a whole page at a time. And look at that! Variable 51 input number is set to 235. So input number is something that is kind of useful, but I've personally really never used it. Though, if you wanted to have like a door that opens depending on typing in a specific code, you could do it this way with an input number. One thing that's important to mention now that we've covered show choices and input number is that the interactable windows for those events will change position depending on if there was a show text event command used before. For example, if we use a show text and then show choices, the choices list will appear along the right side of the screen, and our text will still be present as we make our choice. I think this looks pretty nice. However, if we don't have a show text beforehand, the window for our choices or for our input number will instead appear in the top left corner of the screen. This looks a little bit less nice in my opinion. For that reason, it's a good idea to make sure you're using a show text command before you use a show choices or input number command. Now let's take a look at the next event command, which is change text options. Change text options is pretty straightforward as well in that it allows you to change where the text is shown on screen and control if the text box should appear at all. The default in game is position bottom window show. I use this sometimes though when I want to do a dramatic thing where the message appears in the middle of the screen and the text box is hidden after we've done a fade to black and some text appears in the middle of the screen. And we'll cover how to do a fade to black later in this tutorial. For testing purposes though, let's do this. Let's say text appear in the middle of the screen and hide the window. There we go. And then let's put some text after this. So he'll say, now my text is in the middle of the screen. There we go. Let's test this out in game. All right, so let's talk to our old dude again and we'll see by default, it appears at the bottom of the screen and the text window is shown. But now let's advance to the next thing. Here we go. Now his text is in the middle of the screen and the text box is hidden. So one thing that we do need to be very careful of though, is that now that we've changed our text options, it will apply to all other text boxes in the game. So 
His first line of text is appearing in the middle of the screen and the text window is hidden. If we talk to this other dude over here, that text option will also be applied. We need to be very careful when using change text options and make sure that at the end of our event, we change them back to default, which is bottom show. Otherwise, these change text options will apply to all other text boxes, which can sometimes look very strange. I think that about does it for change text options though. That one's pretty straightforward. Now let's look at the next event command, which is button input processing. Right off the bat, I wanna let you know that I've actually never used button input processing in any of my projects, but I still wanna review it with you. The way that it works is every button in the game has an associated number. The game will wait for us to press a button and depending on the button that we press, it will change the variable set here to that number. So for example, let's make a new variable here. I made one called variable 52 button pressed. And then when we go into our game, what it will do is it will wait for us to press a button and it will set that variable to a number based on the button we pressed. Every button has a number. So for example, the enter key is the number 13. Down is two, left is four, right is six, and up is eight. Let's show this off in game real quick. All right, let's talk to our old guy here. He'll say, hello, I'm an event. And now the game is waiting for us to press a button. So I'm gonna press up. And now the value of our variable should be changed based on the number we pressed. So let's once again go into our debug. Let's go to variables. Let's press the S key to go down a couple times. And look at that. The button pressed is eight because we pressed up. Let's test this out one more time. Let's say, hello, I'm an event. And now let's press enter. Now, if we go in and go to field options variables and go down again, we'll see that it's 13 because I pressed enter. So this does have some uses, but like I said before, I've actually never used this in any of my projects. So if you can come up with a cool idea for a puzzle that uses button input processing, more power to you. I'd love to see it utilized some way. But yeah, like I said before, I've never used it. But you know what event command I have used a lot? The next one on our list, which is wait. What wait does is exactly what it sounds like it does. It makes the game wait. In the wait command, we can define a number of frames for the game to wait before moving on to the next event command. One thing that's good to remember is that 20 frames equals one second. So if we change this number to 40 frames, it will wait two seconds before moving on to the next command. If we make this 10 frames, that's essentially saying we're gonna wait a half second before moving to the next command. For testing purposes, let's make this 40 frames and then let's put another show text underneath that says, you waited two seconds. There we go. Let's test this out in game now. All right, let's talk to our dude again. He'll say, hello, I'm an event. Now when we press enter, the game will wait 40 frames before displaying the next text. So let's see, one Mississippi, two Mississippi. Hey, there we go, you waited two seconds. There we go, that's how the wait command works. The wait command is incredibly useful for setting up events with strict timing, such as cutscenes. I use wait a lot. It's one of the more common events that you can use in your game. Now let's look at the next event command, which is comment. The comment event command doesn't really have any functionality and is mostly used for organizational purposes. Let's leave a note right here. Sometimes it's useful to leave notes for yourself so you can remember exactly what your event is doing and why, especially in longer and more complicated events. So as an example of a comment, we can just say, this is a comment. There you go. I don't use these as much as I probably should. If you're ever working on a team with other people, I would recommend leaving a lot of comments in your events. That's basically it for comments though, so let's move on to probably my favorite event command of all, the next one, conditional branch. Conditional branch allows us to check if something is true or false and then branch our events to run different sequences of event commands based on the result, similar to show choices from earlier. There's so many different things we can check this way too, so let's create one as an example. When creating a conditional branch, we must first define what we're checking. We can check if a switch is on or off, or we can check the value of a variable. We can check if the value of that variable is equal to or greater than or less than or greater than or equal to or not equal to a certain constant variable value that we can set in here or the value of another variable. We can even check self switches and see if those are on or off. We can check timer values. There's so much to check here. And I'll admit, it's a lot of stuff. I won't cover how to do all of these right now, but this is certainly something that I would recommend that you mess around with. We don't use too many of the values on any of the other pages, but there are still a couple that are useful, so let's look at those. On page two, I would recommend not using any of these ever, because this is kind of more general RPG Maker stuff, rather than Pokemon Essentials stuff. On page three, one useful check is actually the character direction check. 
What we could do is do a check and see if our player is facing down or facing up, and then have our event do different things based on the direction our player is facing. We could even do this for other events too, based on the direction that they're facing. On page 4, we can actually check our gold. Gold, funnily enough, is actually the money that the player has in their inventory at that time. I would recommend avoiding the item, weapon, and armor options here since these don't work with Pokemon Essentials. These are more standard RPG Maker type things. The button is being pressed condition can be used and will return true if the corresponding button is held at the time the conditional branch is triggered. I've honestly never used this in any of my events before, but it's good to know that it can be used. When clicking on it, we can see that there's a list of buttons, down, left, right, and up are straightforward, but there's also A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and L and R. Those don't actually correspond to the keyboard buttons, but instead to the game's action bindings. To see our game's action bindings, just press F1 while the game is running and it will open up the key bindings menu. I'll put a full list on screen here for visualization, but in general, up, down, left, and right are up, down, left, and right, so that's pretty straightforward. A is action, B is back, and C is use. And then from there, X is jump up, Y is jump down, and Z is special. And then finally, L is the first unused binding up there in the top right, that's the Q key, and R is the second unused binding up there in the top right, which is the W key. Like I said, I've never used this in any of my events, but it's good to know that it can be used. At the bottom here, the most crazy open-ended one, and probably the most awesome one, is script. This allows us to do some creative things with code and custom methods if we want to get really advanced. For the sake of this tutorial though, let's keep it simple. Let's not go too crazy into scripting stuff just yet. So, for our conditional branch, let's actually do something different if the character player is facing up. At the bottom, you'll notice this checkbox here also for set handling when conditions do not apply. If this is ever unchecked, then our conditional branch will only care about our check being true. If the check is false, then we just simply won't do anything. I like keeping this checked though, because we can always see what we're doing if the check is true, and then what we're doing if the check is false. If we ever don't want to do something on false, then we can just leave that section of the event commands empty. Alright, now here we can see our conditional branch. We can see that it's checking to see if the player is facing up, and if the player is facing up, let's do show text saying, you're facing up. There we go. Otherwise, else, let's say you're not facing up. Go away. <laughs> this guy doesn't like you if you're not talking to him while facing up. Now, let's test this out in our game. All right, so let's talk to our old dude from the left. He'll say, hello, I'm an event. Wait, you're not facing up. Go away. But now let's talk to him while facing up. Oh, hi, I'm an event. Whoa, you're facing up. I like you now. You're my friend. There we go. So that's extremely cool. As a heads up, this is probably one of the most impactful event commands of all, and I would highly recommend you get very familiar with conditional branches for your events. I use them a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, and they allow you to do so many different things. You can even nest conditional branches inside of other conditional branches. It's just, it's crazy. Man, I love conditional branches so much. But yeah, gushing aside, let's move on to the next event command, which is loop. The way that loop works is that it continually repeats all of the event commands inside of the loop until you run a break loop command, or exit the event in another way, which we'll be covering soon. I don't use loop and break loop too often, but even still, let's make an example with them. First, let's create a loop here, and then let's put our text inside of the loop. So whenever we talk to our guy, he'll say, hello, I'm an event, and then it'll repeat, and he'll say, hello, I'm an event, and just repeat and repeat forever and forever. Let's allow us to break out of the loop though. Let's make a show choices here for yes and no. Then above it, let's do a show text that says, do you want to break out of the loop? If we hit yes, then he'll say, okay, the loop is ending now. And then afterwards, let's do break loop. So if we select yes, we'll break out of the loop. If we select no though, then he'll say, okay, loop, looping continues. This guy is getting a little loopy. All right, now let's test it out in game. All right, so let's talk to our old dude and see how it works to loop. He'll say, hello, I'm an event. Do you want to break out of the loop? No, I don't want to. Okay, looping continues. Hey, I'm an event. Do you want to break out? No. Okay, looping continues. Do you want to break out? Oh, let's hit yes now. And he'll say, okay, the loop's ending now. And then we break out of the loop. 
so that's pretty cool. As I said earlier, I don't really use loop too much, but it does still have its uses. It's something that you could get pretty creative with if you want to find ways to make loops work for your game. But yeah, that's basically it for loop and break loop. Let's look at the next event command now, which is exit event processing. Exit event processing is an extremely straightforward command that just closes out the event. Even if there are commands underneath that would be next in line to run, exit event processing doesn't care at all. Let's create a quick little example of this. So we can create an exit event processing and then let's show text under here that says, Wahoo! So even if we have more commands underneath, you know what, let's paste a bunch of them. Our guy should say Wahoo a bunch, but since we have an exit event processing right here, it doesn't care about anything underneath and we'll just close out the event at that time. Let's show this off in game real quick. All right, let's talk to our old dude. He should say Wahoo a bunch of times, right? But no, we have an exit event processing. So he'll say, hello, I'm an event, and then it'll just exit the event processing. Right on. This is actually a pretty useful command if you ever want to exit out of an event and ensure everything underneath doesn't run. But yeah, this isn't one I use too frequently, but I've used it occasionally. Now, let's look at the next event command in the list, which is erase event. What erase event does is delete our event until we leave the map and then come back. So it's a temporary deletion. Unlike exit event processing, all event commands underneath will still run. So let's set up an example of this. First, let's call erase event here, and then underneath, let's do some show text. You'll say, ah, I've been erased. Oh no, oh, poor old guy. So what he'll do is say, hello, I'm an event, and then we'll call erase event, and we'll see him disappear, and then he'll say, ah, I've been erased. With that said, I guess let's test this out in game. All right, let's talk to our old dude to erase him. He'll say, hello, I'm an event, and then boom, you see him disappear there, but all of the event commands underneath, so this show text, will still run. Ah, I've been erased. Oh no, poor old guy. Thankfully, it's very easy to get them back. All we have to do is initiate a map transfer or walk across a map connection far enough to reload the map our event is on. First, let's do debug to initiate a map transfer. What we can do is press F9, field options, warp to map, and let's just warp to test town. There we go. So now that we've done a map transfer, our old guy will respawn. So let's go test that out real quick. Old guy, I'm coming to you. Hello. Hey, there he is. All right. Now let's erase him again. Oh, poor guy. He's been erased again. So this is an important thing to note. When walking over a map connection, that's not considered necessarily a map transfer. So it's not enough to unload and reload the map. Our old guy will still be deleted because the map has not been reloaded. If we walk far enough away from the map transfer though, then that will be enough for the map to be unloaded and reloaded. So let's just walk all the way to the far left edge of Test Town here. Boop, there we go, touch the tree, and then walk back. We're doing little laps here, you know. This is a little sprinting exercise where we're running left and then running right. So now that we've walked far enough away from the map connection, that was enough to unload and then reload the map so the old guy will reappear again. And then just for good measure, let's erase him one more time. Ah, uh, poor guy. Erase event is pretty useful if you want to have an event that only happens once on a map. For example, I sometimes have events that are set up to auto run and then change a couple values around and then call erase event on themselves. This way, if we leave that map and then come back, that event will still always run at least once when the map is first entered and then it will erase itself. That's about it for erase event though. Let's look at the next event command, which is call common event. As a heads up, I basically never use call common event, but it is very useful and powerful. I kind of wish I used it more to be honest with you. So in RPG Maker, if you select the database tab along the top bar here, you'll see a lot of generic RPG Maker XP stuff that you don't ever want to touch. But one of these tabs is common events. Common events are events that can be triggered anywhere in your game, so think of them as global events, kind of more broad events. There are a couple already defined here in Pokemon Essentials, such as this Oak phone call, where he grades your Pokedex based on how many Pokemon you've caught. You can always add new common events to the list as well. So let's just make one really quick here and call this test common event. And then we can insert a text command here and have that just say, hello, test. There we go. Now that we have a new common event in our list, we can go back to our event. And then from here, we can do call common event. And then within the call common event, we can choose from our defined common events. And we can see our test common event here. Ta-da, there we go. Now let's test this out in game. All right, so our old guy should say, hello, I'm an event. And then afterwards we'll call the common event that just says, hello, test. 
So like I said before, I don't really use common events too frequently, but they are powerful, and if you get creative, you could start defining some very cool common events that you could call from a lot of different events in your game. And speaking of powerful, creative event commands that I rarely use, let's look at the next two event commands, which are Label and Jump to Label. I should really use these more often, because they're super useful. What Label does is create a point in your list of event commands that's denoted by a string of text. And you can type in anything you want for your label. So, let's just call ours Label A. Okay. Then, if we now call a Jump to Label command, we can type in the text of the label we wish to jump to. So we could type in label A. What this allows us to do is essentially force our sequence of event commands to skip either forward or backward to the label that we specified and then continue running from there. Make sure there are no typos here, since jump to label will not work if the text does not exactly match an existing label in the event. Let's really quickly make an example that showcases our jump to label working. So here we have our label, label A, and there's our jump to label, label A. So let's actually put our label at the very bottom. Then, in between our jump to label and our label A, let's do a bunch of show texts that we can skip over. Now let's paste a bunch of these, and there we go. So our guy says, hello, I'm an event, and then he would scream, ah, a bunch, but instead we're using jump to label to then jump to label A at the end. Then, let's do an insert show text, and he'll say, this is the end of the event. So, using jump to label, label A, we'll skip all this sequence of event commands and go right here to our label, and then run the event command right here after the label. This is a very basic example, but labels and jump to labels are extremely powerful. If you have a really long event with a long series of event commands, being able to jump to specific points in that list is huge. Let's test this out though. Hello old guy, long time no see, what do you have to say? Hello, I'm an event, and then we'll see a jump to label here. Ah, this is the end of the event. So we skipped over all that text in the middle that just said, ah, that's pretty cool. Jump to label also works when going backwards up through the list of event commands. So in this example, what we'll see is one, two, and three repeatedly because we're constantly jumping back up to label A. That's about it for label and jump to label. Let's look at the next event command now, which is control switches. Control switches, as well as control variables and control self switch, are some of my most commonly used event commands. I talked about them briefly in the last tutorial, but let's go through them all again here as a review. Switches are global booleans that can be used by all events. And when I say switches are booleans, what I mean is that they can only ever have one of two states, on or off. When a new switch is made, it's defaulted to off. We can use the control switches command though here to turn them on. When selecting control switches, we could choose the switch that we want to change, or we could select a range of switches by using the batch option here. I don't really ever use this, but it is nice to be able to turn on and off a range of switches. So for example, we could change switch 76 to 80 and turn them all on. For this example though, let's keep it simple and do a single switch. And let's double click it and make a new one. From the last tutorial, we actually already made a switch called Blue Guy Gone, so let's make a new one here on switch 77. That we'll just call example switch. There we go. And we want to set example switch to on. So for operation, we'll select on and then hit OK. As we can see here now, our event is turning switch 77 on. Let's expand a little bit on this example though and incorporate a conditional branch. We can get a little bit more fancy with our examples now that we've covered some of these other event commands. So let's make it so that way if the switch that we just set up, example switch is on, we'll do something, otherwise we'll do something else. So if our switch is on, let's insert a show text here that says switch is on. Otherwise, if the switch is off, let's insert text that says switch is off. You'll notice though, the switch is always gonna be on because we're turning it on right here. So let's actually instead modify it after we talk to our guy. So, if the switch is on, he'll say switch is on, then let's edit this and turn it off. So now what we've got here is he'll say, hello, I'm an event, and then it'll check to see if the switch is on. If the switch is on, he'll say, the switch is on, and then he'll turn it off. Otherwise, he'll say, the switch is off, and then turn it on. That's kind of cool. Let's test it out in-game. Let's talk to our guy and modify these switches. So he'll say, hello, I'm an event, the switch is off. Oh, dang, the switch is off, but I think it should now have just been turned on, right? Hello, I'm an event. The switch is now on. There we go. Hello, I'm an event. The switch is off. Hello, I'm an event. The switch is on. There we go. We are modifying the switch to be on or off from this conditional branch. It's pretty cool.
And this is just scratching the surface too. I talked about it a little bit in the last tutorial, but you can use switches in event page conditions as well. So these switches can determine if events are even appearing in your game, which is, once again, very cool stuff. Hopefully you're still following me, I apologize if this is pretty complicated stuff, but I think now would be a good time for us to move on to the next event command, which is control variables. Variables are global values that all events can access, similar to switches, but unlike switches, variables can be set to any number of different values. When choosing control variables, we can choose to modify a single variable or use the batch command to modify a range of variables, just like we could do with switches. Let's go in here though, let's double click, and let's make a new variable here on variable 53, and we'll just call this test variable. There we go. Underneath this, we can select the operation for our variable. We can choose to set our variable to a number, or we can add, subtract, multiply, divide, or even modulo. For those unfamiliar with modulo, that's just finding the remainder of a division, so 11 modulo 3 would be 2. Underneath this is the operand, or the number we'll be working with for our variable. If we just want to set our variable to a number here, we could use constant and then type in the number we want to set to, so like 100 for example. One thing we could do instead though is do add and do 1, so every time we talk to our NPC here, we could increase the value of the variable by 1, so that's another way we could use variables. Instead of a constant, we could also use the value of another variable that exists, and we could set to that or add to that. There's a lot of different things we could do here with other variable values. We could even set the value of our variable to a random value between a range of values. So for example, between 1 and 1000, and it'll choose a random value in between those. I don't really use any of the operands underneath, but the character and other options do have some interesting choices as well. So for example, if we select character, we could select an existing event and then get their map X coordinates, Y coordinates, direction, and so forth. And then within other, we could get things like the map's ID, our gold, which would be our money, even our steps. So there are other interesting values we could use here. I don't really ever use these, but it's nice to have the option. For the purpose of our example though, let's just set it to a random value between 1 and 1000. Then let's hit OK, and there's our event. Now, let's test this out in-game. When we talk to our event here, it should now be setting the value of variable 53 to a random value between 1 and 1000. Let's open up our debug menu once again, go to field options, variables, and press S a couple times and go down and check it. There it is! Our test variable has been set to 532. That's a pretty nice value. I use control variables and control switches a lot because switches and variables are very important to the logic of the game. There's so much that they can do, and I recommend getting very familiar with control switches and control variables. I also recommend getting very familiar with the next event command in the list, which is control self-switch. Now, unlike switches and variables, which are global, self-switches are local. The idea is that these are switches that only this event can use. These are super useful, since you don't need to make a global switch and muddy the list of switches every time you want an event to have a different state. When selecting control self-switch, we can see that there are four choices for our self-switches. There's A, B, C, and D. And from here, we can also choose to turn them on or off. So let's select A and then set up an example event. I personally like to use self-switches a lot for keeping track of event states and pages. So for our example event, let's actually make our event turn blue after we talk to them once. To do this, let's just turn self-switch A on after we've talked to them once. Then, let's copy this event page and paste it. From here, on event page 2, let's just say event page 2 will be used if self-switch A is on. Then what we can do is select our NPC and adjust the hue slider a little bit so our dude is blue. Now, what we can do is also turn this off. So after we talk to him when he's blue, let's turn self-switch A off. And just for fun, let's modify his dialogue a little bit. So he'll say, I'm an event. I'm feeling a little blue, actually. And then after we turn self-switch A off, let's do another show text where he'll say, I feel better now. There we go. Nice. So let's test this out in game. All right, so here's our old guy. Let's talk to him and he'll say, hello, I'm an event. And then we turn self switch A on. And as you can see, now event page two is shown where our old man is blue. But let's talk to them again. Hello, I'm an event. I'm feeling a little blue actually. Oh wait, I feel better now. Wow, that's amazing. So we just turned self switch A on and then off. And we could repeat this process if we want. Ah, uh, that's pretty great. I like our, I like our old blue man. 
Self switches are incredibly useful and I use them a ton. For example, a lot of times self switches are used for trainers. After you beat them, it'll turn their self switch A on and then they won't want to fight you anymore. Also, it's a little bit advanced, but as a teaser, there are ways to modify the self switches of other events from your event, but that's a little bit advanced and we won't cover that right now. What we'll do instead is move on to the next event command in the list, which is Control Timer. What Control Timer does is start a countdown and display a window with a timer value based on the minutes and second values that are passed into it. When we select Control Timer, we can see that there are two operations here. We can choose to start a timer or stop it. Let's set our event to start a timer with a value of, let's say, 4 minutes and 20 seconds, just two random values. Then let's hit OK, and then make our friend NPC over here stop the timer when we talk to him. So we just select Stop, and then there we go. It's a little bit advanced, but theoretically we could make another event with a conditional branch that branches depending on the value of that timer. Check it out, if you do conditional branch, timer is something that we can choose here. We can do more or less as well. And then if we wanted to make things real stressful, we could have a parallel process conditional event that triggers a game over if the timer ever falls down to below zero. Now that would be stressful as heck, and thankfully, for the case of our example, we're just going to showcase a basic timer here. So let's see how these events look in game. When we talk to our wise friend here, he should say, hello, I'm an event, and then trigger the timer. And as you can see, it's using the minutes and second values that we passed into it, and it's counting down one second every second. That's pretty neat. If we talk to him again, since we're doing control timer and just setting the values again, it should reset the timer. There you go. I like that it does display a window in the top right too, that's very cool. Now let's talk to our other friend over here and let's do stop timer. There we go! Look at that! Timers are pretty neat. They're very interesting in that they can inject some stressful elements into your game. That's basically it for timers though. Now let's look at the next event command in the list, which is change gold. Change gold is super straightforward in that this just changes how much money we have. We can choose to increase or decrease our money, and then we can choose a number to increase or decrease by. We could increase by a thousand, or we could increase by the value of another variable. For the purpose of this testing though, let's make it so every single time we talk to our friend here, he'll give us a thousand dollars. That's a pretty sweet deal. Let's test this event out in game. When we interact with our generous friend here, He'll say, hello, I'm an event, and then that should have just increased our money by 1,000. If we want to test this, let's open our menu and then select Red, who's our player character here. Right now we can see we have 4,000 money. Let's talk to him again. I'm interested in some free money. Oh, it's 5,000 now. Oh, heck yeah. Let's talk to him again. 6,000. Oh, yes. Infinite money. Thank you very much. As you can see, change gold is very straightforward. In the context of RPG Maker stuff, gold is essentially our money. Now, let's look at some of the next event commands. Since this tutorial has already been running 40 minutes, you'll be pleased to know that the next 10 event commands are commands that I never use. Change items, change weapons, change armor, and change party member are all commands that you're never going to need to use. These are commands that are more used for conventional RPG Maker games, not for Pokemon Essentials. Additionally, change window skin does not function in Pokemon Essentials, change battle BGM and change battle NME are better set in other locations, which we'll talk about in the future, and change save access and change menu access are kind of interesting because you can limit if the player can save or open the menus. I've never used them, but it is pretty interesting to be able to turn off the ability to save. So actually, let's give that a test. Let's right now disable save access. And just for fun, let's also go in and disable menu access. I've also never used Change Encounter, because this is also another RPG Maker XP type thing, not necessarily a Pokemon Essentials type thing. So let's test this event in game right now and showcase how we can disable menu access and save access. Alright, so right now I can open the menu, but after I talk to my friend here, I cannot open the menu. Interesting. That's kind of cool, but what if we only wanted to disable save access? I updated our event, so now it should only disable save access. So right now I can open the menu still and we can see save is present in the list. Now let's talk to our guy, and save has been removed from the list. So that's pretty useful, that's kind of interesting. If you wanted to make a game that kind of had save points that you had to walk on top of in order to save, then this would be how you would do it. And that does it for event commands page one. Thank you so much for sticking with me up to this point. Just checking and making sure you're still paying attention. You'll be pleased to know that event page two has a lot of very amazingly useful stuff as well. And a lot of it will be faster to go through. And just as a little bit of a heads up, 95% of the event commands on page three, we never use. So we're actually most of the way done. Now let's start looking at event commands page two, starting with transfer player. 
What Transfer Player does is essentially teleport our player to a map and location of our choosing. I always use Direct Appointment, and I've never actually used Appoint with Variables. In our Direct Appointment, we can double-click on this field here to open the map list and start choosing our maps. For our testing, let's make it so it warps us to our test town. What we can do is we can also middle-click with our mouse and browse around the map here. Then, when we find a point that we want to teleport our player to, we can left-click it, and that point will be represented by this white square. We can also see in the top right here that we're selecting tile 25, 10. 25 being the X coordinate, and 10 being the Y coordinate. Now, let's hit OK. Underneath this, we can choose the direction that our player will be at after the transfer. If we select Retain, the player will be facing the same direction that they were when the transfer was initiated. So if I'm facing right, after the transfer, I'll be facing right. For testing purposes, let's select Down here. And then the other option is Fading. I basically always use Yes, but if you want to transfer without a fade, you could select No. There we go. So now when we talk to our friend here, he will teleport us into Test Town. Let's test this out in-game. All right, here's our friend. Let's talk to him. Hello, I'm an event. And then, whoa, look at that. I've now been teleported into Test Town, and I'm facing down. Whoa, what the heck? This guy's got teleportation powers. That's crazy. Transfer Player is an incredibly powerful event command. As you can probably imagine, Transfer Player is used by doors or cave entrances to move you in and out between those two maps, and there's so many other places where it can be used as well. And thankfully, it's super straightforward and easy to use. You just open the map, you click where you want to go, and then you'll go there. Now, let's look at the next event command on page 2, which is Set Event Location. Set Event Location is basically a teleport like Transfer Player, but for other events in our map. You can select the event that you'd want to teleport from the list at the top here, but let's just select this event. Then, much like Transfer Player, you can choose a direct appointment or to appoint with variables. I never use appoint with variables, though. When selecting Direct Appointment, you can double-click it and then browse the map just like we did with Transfer Player. And you can even middle-click and browse the list here, and then left-click, and then this will be where our event is teleported to. There's an additional option here, though, where you can choose for the event to exchange positions with another event. I think this will be pretty funny, so let's use this! Let's make sure we have the correct event selected here, though, because our guy is Event 1, and then our old man is Event 2, so we want our old man to change places with Event 1. Then, at the bottom here, we can select the direction that we'd want our event to be facing after the transfer. Let's select Up. And there we go! Let's test this out in-game now! So, every time we talk to our old man here, he should be trading places with our other friend. So, let's talk to him. He says, Hello, I'm an event! Whoa, would you look at that? He traded places with him, and now he's facing up. Let's talk to him again. Hello, I'm an event! Whoa, they transferred back! What the heck? What do you think about this, friend? He just says, Yo, dude. That's fine. It's a little bit confusing, but look at that! I'm an event! Whoa! That's pretty crazy, looking at our events teleport around like this! Set event location is super cool, and I don't personally use it too much, but it has a lot of very interesting utilities. I think you can do a lot of fun things with events teleporting around like this. Now, let's look at the next event command, which is scroll map. I like to think of scroll map as panning the camera instead. When we select it, we see that we can select the direction, the distance, and the speed of our scroll map. This is super useful for cutscenes, for example, if you want to have an NPC talk about something in the distance, and then pan the camera over to what they're talking about. You need to make sure to do another scroll map at the end of the event, otherwise you'll be walking around with your camera and map all scrolled out of place. So, let's set up an example here, where our old man is talking to us about the lake that's above. So, we scroll the camera up a little bit, and let's make it go up four tiles, and let's have it go... Yeah, let's have it go pretty fast. Then, after our scroll map, let's actually introduce a wait here. Let's wait 20 frames. Then, let's have our old dude say, Look, the lake is so beautiful. Right on, it is a beautiful lake, isn't it? Then, let's actually copy these, and paste these underneath, and then make sure that we scroll the map back down. Essentially, what I'm trying to do is keep track of how much we've gone up, and then make sure we undo that at the end of the event. So we go up, and then we go down. Then, at the very end of the event, let's make our old man talk to us again, and say, Thanks for listening to me talk about the lake. Anytime! I would listen to him talk about the lake anytime. Now, let's test this event out in-game. So, when we talk to him, the camera should go up and then go back down afterwards. So he'll say, Hello, I'm an event! Whoa, look at that! Look, the lake is so beautiful! And it comes back down. Thanks for listening to me talk about the lake! Right on! That worked perfectly! Like I said before, scroll map is very useful for cutscenes. I like to use it a lot, but you just need to be very careful to make sure that you scroll the map back at the end of your event. Now, let's look at the next event command, which is Change Map Settings. 
When we select Change Map Settings, we'll see that it allows us to set a panorama graphic, fog graphic, or battle bat graphic for our map. I never use battle bat graphics, so we can ignore this one entirely. Battle backs are better set somewhere else, and we can dive into that later when we talk more about battles. The panorama graphic is a graphic that will appear under our map if we have any empty tiles. These images live in the Graphics Panoramas folder inside your game folder. I uploaded a test one here that's the Thundaga logo. So let's set our panorama graphic to the Thundaga logo, and then let's go into our map and delete some tiles to give them empty spaces. What we can do is just go into the top left here of our tile set, and then start drawing on the layer 1 to get rid of some of the grass we placed on layer 1. We'll know that it's an empty tile when it's a pure white square like this. Now, let's run our game. So as you can see, it doesn't look great right there. It's kind of just a big black void, and this is because we don't have any panorama graphics set up yet. So let's talk to our old dude and let's set it. Well, look at that. We've got the Thundaga logo now. Oh, look at that. Whoa! All the empty spaces are filled in by the Thundaga logo. That's kind of cool. Maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I think that's kind of neat. The other option that we can select here in Change Map Settings is Fog Graphic. What we can do is select an image that's in our game's Graphics Fogs folder, and then what we can do is apply an Opacity, Blending Mode, Zoom, and we can also give it movement on the X or on the Y, and we can adjust the hue. Instead of appearing under the map, Fogs will actually appear above the map and repeat or tile the selected image. Fogs are pretty intense, and I actually want to cover them in their own specific tutorial in the future. So, for right now, let's just pass over this and say that we're done with change map settings. Let's quickly look at the next two event commands in the list as well, because they're fog related. There's change fog color tone, where you can change the color of the fog, and there's change fog opacity, where you can change the opacity and you can change it over time. So you can change it over the course of 20 frames, which would be one second, or you could make the fog transition take place over the course of 60 frames, which would be 3 seconds. Like I said before, fog is kind of intense, and I want to do a full tutorial on fog in the future, because you can make some very cool effects for your map using fog. Now, let's look at the next event command in the list, which is show animation. What show animation does is take our player or another event and then play an animation on that character. For our testing, let's make it so that way we select our EV02, which is our old guy here, and let's play the animation exclaim bubble on him. This list of animations here is defined in the database tab that we mentioned earlier when discussing common events. In the database tab, we can click on this animations tab, and then look at this, we can see all the animations that have already been defined with Pokemon Essentials. If we want to preview any of the animations in here, we can click on them, and then select play hit along the right side of the window here. Yeah, there we go, that's our exclaim bubble animation. Making animations can be pretty intense, so we'll cover that in a future tutorial. The animation itself lasts around 20 frames too, so let's insert a wait after the animation, so our guy will play the exclaim bubble animation, and then we'll do some text afterwards. Well, he'll say, that's crazy. So this is essentially him reacting. I think that's going to be pretty interesting. Let's test this out in game. So here we are with our elder friend yet again. Let's talk to him and let's see the show animation. So first he'll say, hello, I'm an event. And then afterwards, whoa, exclaim. And then that's crazy. See, the adding the weight afterwards helped a lot. I think show animation is fantastic and should be used a lot in cutscenes, and it helps kind of inject personality and flavor in events where otherwise characters are just talking to each other. I like to use show animations to break things up a little bit, like somebody will say something crazy and then other characters will play exclaim bubbles above them and be like, whoa, what the heck? So it's very cool. There's a lot of different things you can do with show animation, but let's move on to the next event command in our list, which is change transparent flag. What Change Transparent Flag does is make our player invisible. When selecting it, we can choose from Transparent or Normal. Transparent will make the player invisible, and Normal will make the player visible. Let's set up some examples here now. Let's make it so when we talk to our old man here, he'll turn us invisible. Then, when we talk to our friend over here, let's do another Change Transparent Flag where they set us back to visible. Now, let's test this in-game. All right, let's talk to our old friend here who says, hello, I'm an event, and look at that, they've changed the transparent flag, so now we're invisible. We can still walk around though, but we can't see our player character. Now let's talk to our other friend here to reset it, and now we're visible again, nice. I don't really use change transparent flag too often, but it does have some interesting use cases. In particular, if you wanted to make a cutscene on a different map where two characters are talking about the player, what you could do is transfer your player to that map and then make your player invisible or transparent. 
Then from there, you could play out the show text commands for your cutscene as normal, and then transfer the player back to the map that they were on, and then make them visible again. I think that would be a pretty cool effect. Now, let's look at the next event command, which is probably one of the most intimidating, but most important event commands, and that's set move route. What set move route does is take a character, so our player or another event, and then make it move on a path that we set up. When we click on set move route, it'll open up the move route window. And there's a lot going on here in this window. In the top left here is the character that we'll be moving. We can make it the player or any of the other events on this map. For our testing purposes though, let's select this event, so it'll be our old guy moving. The large grid of options here on the right are all of the different move commands that we could use for our event. I can go into more detail on all of these in a future tutorial, and I totally recommend that you play around with these on your own to get familiar with them. For our testing though, let's do a basic move route, where our guy walks up two steps, and then maybe waits 20 frames, and then walks back down two steps. As you can see on the left side of the move route window here, we have a sequence of the move commands that we've selected. Just like the event commands, these are run in sequence from top to bottom, and they can be copied and pasted, or deleted. Underneath these are two additional options that are also important. Repeat action will make it so that way this move route is repeated once the route is completed. I don't use this too often in the move route events themselves, but they are pretty useful if you're setting up an NPC and having them just walk left and right in their autonomous movement section for their event page. The other option here is Ignore If Can't Move. Ignore If Can't Move is super useful, and it will make it so that way if our move route is ever blocked, it will ignore those actions, or skip them. For example, if our player interacts with the old man from above, they'll be blocking those move up move routes. The old man will wait until we get out of their way, and then run the sequence of move commands as expected. But if we enable Ignore If Can't Move, then our old man will skip those move up commands and then just run the rest of the move route, which would just be waiting and then moving down. Move routes are extremely important to get used to using, and probably one of the event commands with the highest learning curve. There are so many cool things you can do with them, but on the flip side, there are so many ways that they can go wrong if you're not careful. A common mistake is not properly setting Ignore If Can't Move in some game cutscenes, which can lead to cases where the game will freeze while waiting for the move route to finish. Another thing to be considerate of is that the next event command in the sequence of event commands will trigger immediately after the move route is started, rather than when it finishes. We can see this by adding a show text command underneath here. Let me plug that in real quick. And let's just have our old man here say Yahoo! What this will do is display the text immediately after the old man starts moving. If you want to make sure that that current move route finishes before moving on to the next event command in the sequence, then look no further than the Wait for Moves Completion event command. Wait for Moves Completion is an event command that was made to go underneath set move route commands and make it so that way the event sequence will pause and wait for the move route to complete before triggering the next event command in the sequence. This is extremely important and useful, and I use it all the time. As a warning though, this can cause issues if you're not careful. Since the game is waiting for the move route to finish, if the move route can never finish, then our event will never move on to the next event command, and our game will essentially be frozen forever. I'm stuck. For that reason, you should be mindful and careful when using move routes and waiting for their completion. I use them all the time though, for events and different cutscenes, and I do still strongly recommend that you play around with them a lot and get familiar with them. Now, let's look at the next three event commands together as a package. These three commands are Prepare for Transition, Execute Transition, and Change Screen Color Tone. Let's break the ordering a little bit here though and start with Change Screen Color Tone, since we'll also be using this for our transitions. What Change Screen Color Tone does is change the color of the screen. When selecting Change Screen Color Tone, we can see the options to adjust the red, green, blue, and gray values. We can adjust these sliders up and down or type in a value here. We can also see a preview on the right side of the window that will showcase the color based on our current selected values. At the bottom here, we can also make this change screen color tone take place over time. This defaults to 20 frames, so our colors will fade in and change over the course of one second. However, we could drop this down to zero frames if we wanted to, so it would happen immediately. Let's make it though so when we talk to our old man over the course of 20 frames, our game will get more blue. So let's just crank all these values to zero essentially, but crank the blue up all the way to the maximum value of 255. There we go. Our old man now when we talk to him, is gonna make the game world more blue. Let's talk to our friend here and he'll say, hello, I'm an event, and then just like that, over the course of 20 frames, he made the game world a little bit more blue. 
Look at that, he's getting his revenge. Earlier in the video we made him blue, now he's making the world blue. I like to use change screen color tone a lot, in particular when transferring the player. As an example, I like to actually use this as a fade to black, so making all these down to zero, over the course of, say, 10 frames. Then I'll insert a weight of, let's say, about 12 frames. Then what I do is I transfer the player. So for this example, let's just transfer to Test Town. Then from here, what we can do is copy these and then make this fade back into the default values, which are all zero. Now let's see how this looks in game. Let's talk to our friend here again, and he'll say hello, I'm an event, and then it'll fade to black, then do the transfer, and then fade back in. Now, I think that looks pretty damn good. What do you think? There are ways we can make it look even better, though, and that's by using Prepare for Transition and Execute Transition. Prepare and Execute Transition are a two-piece combo, where Prepare is called first, and then Execute is called after. We'll also want to call something in between, so our screen is different before and after the transition. And you already know what we're going to use, it's got to be change screen color tone. As a word of caution, whenever we call prepare for transition, that makes our game stop updating the screen's graphics until an execute transition is called. If you only ever use a prepare transition, and then never actually call an execute transition underneath, you'll cause your game's screen to appear to freeze. So what we've got here is our prepare for transition, then underneath let's change the screen color tone to like a dark red. Let's lower the green and blue values a little bit, and let's raise the gray values. Yeah, I think that looks good. Let's make sure that the time is also zero frames here. We want this to be zero frames, since the fade is actually going to come from the transition instead. Now, let's finally call Execute Transition. When selecting Execute Transition, we'll be given the option to select a transition graphic. These are image files that live inside of the game's Graphics Transitions folder. What the transition does is, over the course of 40 frames, or 2 seconds, fade from our initial screen state to the new screen state. I like to think of this as prepare for transition is taking a screenshot of our game at that time, and then execute transition is fading from that screenshot to our new screen state. This transition uses the black and white values of the transition image. The darker black and gray sections will fade first, and then the lighter gray and white sections of the image will fade last. So let's select one that we think looks cool here. I kind of like Battle 2 because it's kind of got a radial effect. So let's select this and then let's see how it looks in game. So once again, let's talk to our old pal here and he'll say, hello, I'm an event. And then there's the transition. Whoa, look at that. That was a nice radial transition where now we've entered a dark red state. That's pretty dope. There's a lot you can do with prepare for transition and execute transition, though I honestly don't use them as much as I probably should. I think they're really cool, plus it is possible for you to make your own transitions, since they're ultimately just image files that live inside of the game's graphics transitions folder. Now that we've gone through those, let's look at the next event command in the list, which is Screen Flash. Screen Flash is super straightforward, since all it does is flash a color over the screen for a set amount of time. When selecting Screen Flash, we can choose the red, green, and blue values here, as well as the strength. Think of strength like opacity, where 255 is the strongest, so the color will be the most opaque. Lowering this value will make the color more and more transparent. Then, we can also choose how long we want the screen flash to last. As a pro tip, this screen flash will always start at the maximum strength that we've set here on the first frame of the flash, and then spend the rest of the frames fading out. Let's set it to a value of 20 here, so it fades out over a second. And then, let's make it like a nice kind of green flash. That'll look kind of cool. Now let's hit OK, and then test this out in-game. Let's talk to our old man here again and see what he has to say. Hello, I'm an event. Now we should see a green screen flash. Look at that, whoa! As you can see, it starts off, boom, very strong at the strength that we set, and then fades out over the course of 20 frames. That's kind of cool. I don't really use screen flash too often, but it is pretty useful for some cutscenes. The same could also be said for the next event command in the list, which is screen shake. Screen Shake does exactly what it sounds like it does. It shakes the screen. I like to think of this as the camera rapidly panning back and forth horizontally. When selecting Screen Shake, we can see that there are options for power, speed, and time. Power determines how far or big the shaking movements are. Speed determines how fast or how rapidly the screen shakes occur. And finally, time determines the length of the shake. Let's set this to like 20 frames, so the screen shake will take a second. Now, let's hit OK and then test this out in-game. All right, let's talk to our old man and see a screen shake. Oh, okay, that was, that was all right. We saw the screen shake over the course of 20 frames, but what if we cranked those values up even higher? 
All right, I've now set the screen shake values to their maximum, which is nine. So the maximum power and speed are nine. So now let's see how this looks. Whoa, holy moly, the screen was really shaken there. It was shaken so much that we even started getting black bars along the edge of the screen. Hot dang, that is a powerful screen shake. In my opinion, screen shakes should be used a lot. I think that screen shakes, when used properly, can add a lot of juice to events. Just checking in again and making sure you're still doing well. We're in the home stretch now, over an hour in, and we just have this last column here on page two, and then a couple of event commands on page three. A lot of the event commands left on page two can be considered package deals, so they should go by pretty quickly. And speaking of package deals, the next five event commands are a package, and those are the picture commands. We have show picture, move picture, rotate picture, change picture color tone, and erase picture. First, let's look at show picture. What show picture does is draw an image from our game's graphics pictures folder onto the screen. When we select it, we can see that there's a lot of options here. Firstly, we can choose a number for our picture. This is really important to keep track of, since if we ever want to have multiple pictures drawn, we'll need to give each of them a unique number. The picture number is referenced by other picture commands, such as erase picture, so we need to be organized and aware of each picture's number. For this tutorial though, we'll keep it simple and just show one picture and keep the number one. Next, we can choose the picture graphic. Let's double click this and we can see the list of pictures. As I mentioned earlier, these are pictures that live inside our game's graphics pictures folder. There sure are a lot in here, huh? At any time, we could also add in our own custom images too. For testing though, let's select intro Meryl. I like this image a lot since Meryl is a little cutie. Next, we'll choose where our image is displayed. We can select the image's origin point as well as the image's X and Y coordinates. Just like with transfer player, we could also use variables here, but I basically never use these. An important thing to mention before we dive any deeper into image origin and coordinates is that the screen considers the top left point to be 0, 0. If we increase our X value, the image will move to the right, and if we decrease the X value, the image will move to the left. And for the Y value, if we increase the Y value, the image will move down, and if we decrease it, the image will move up. I hope that all makes sense. The image's origin point determines which part of the image we place at our set coordinates. We can choose to use the top left of the image or the center of the image as our origin point. A good way to think about this is that if we use upper left and set our coordinates to 0, 0, then our picture will always display in the top left of the screen and not be cut off. If we decide to use center as the image origin and set that to 0, 0, then the center of our image will be placed in the top left corner of the screen, and the top half, as well as the left half of the image, will be cut off. As a reminder, the default screen size for a Pokemon Essentials fan game is 512 by 384. So, if you wanted to place an image in the very center of the screen, you would select center as the origin, and then use the coordinates 256 by 192. This will give you the very center of the screen. After this, we can determine the zoom values for X and Y. Zoom is really just size or scale, so a value of 100 is essentially just showing the image with a size multiplier of 1.0. If we crank these up to 200 though, we'll actually be doubling the image size. Next is opacity, which much like strength in our screen flash, determines how transparent the displayed image is. A value of 255 means no transparency, but if we lowered this value, that would mean our Meryl would become more see-through. And lastly is our blending mode. There are options here for normal, additive, and subtractive. I basically never use anything other than normal, but as an example, I'll show all three side by side right here. Next up is move picture. What move picture allows us to do is take a picture and edit any of the values that we just talked about over a period of time. So when we select move picture, we can see that we have a similar window to the one we just looked at for show picture. In the top left here, we can set the number of the picture we want to move, so in our case, one. We can then also set how long we want this move picture event to take. Let's just go with 20 frames again, so it takes one second. Then we can choose to change the origin, the coordinates, the zoom, the opacity, or the blending. For our testing purposes though, let's still set it so our Meryl is centered and the X is 256 and the Y is 192. But if we wanted to move this to the left a little bit, we should subtract from the X here. So let's just set this to 100. And then let's increase our zoom values here so it goes up to 300 so our Meryl gets bigger. Let's include a little bit of a wait in between these though. So let's wait 20 frames after we show it. And then let's also wait 20 frames after we move it. 
Now, let's test this in-game. So, let's talk to our friend here. What should happen is he'll talk to us, and then he'll show the Meryl, then it'll wait 20 frames, and then, whoa, then the Meryl slid to the left there. That's the power of Move Picture. That's pretty cool. Move Picture is very powerful and allows us to do a lot of cool different things with our pictures. The same is true for the next event command in our list, which is Rotate Picture. What Rotate Picture does is continually rotate our image until we tell it to stop rotating. When we select it, we can see that there are two values here, image number and speed. Just like before, we're working with image number one, so we're gonna keep this at one. The speed value determines how many degrees the image is rotated per frame, so a low speed value means a slower rotation. You can also choose to use positive or negative values here to control the direction. So for example, a value of positive five will rotate the image to the left. If we change this to negative five, the image will rotate to the right. If we ever set this to zero, this will be stopping the rotation. So let's make an example event here where our image rotates to the right, let's do negative five, and then what we can do is insert a wait here where let's wait, say, 30 frames, and then let's stop the rotation. So to do that, we do rotate picture, one, speed, zero. There we go. Now let's test this out in game. When we talk to our friend here, we should see it show the Meryl and then it should begin rotating. And then after 30 frames, it stops. Look at that. Let's interact with him again. Hello, show the Meryl, rotate it, and then stop. There you go. I've never really used rotate picture, but hey, it's good to know it's a thing. Next up is change picture color tone. As I'm sure you can already imagine, what this allows us to do is take a picture from our picture number and then modify the red, blue, green, and gray color values over a period of time. Let's try to make our Meryl more green though so it looks like it's shiny. And then let's also do this over 20 frames and then add a weight of 20 frames at the end of the event. After our Meryl image is shown, we should see it start to fade to green. Whoa, okay, well, it's not exactly a shiny Meryl, it's more like a radioactive Meryl, but you know, we did make it more green. I think this is a great segue into the next and final picture event command, which is Erase Picture. As you can probably tell, uh, the Meryl isn't going away. We've shown it, but we haven't erased it, so the picture just kind of stays on the screen. Well, Erase Picture is how we would get rid of this. And you'll be pleased to know that Erase Picture is extremely simple. All we do is specify the number for the picture we'd want to erase, and then that's it. So what we've got here in our event is the Meryl shows up, then it turns green, then we wait 20 frames afterwards, and then we erase it. Let's increase this time a little bit longer, so we have a little bit more time to admire the radioactive Meryl we've created. But let's get into game and test this now. Alright, so after the Meryl is shown, it should turn green and then get erased. So right there it turns green, then we wait a little bit, and then boom, there we go, it erases the image. Look at that. We've successfully shown an image and then gotten rid of it and modified it many ways along the way. It's important to remember that every time we show a picture, we should remember to call erase picture at the end. If we're ever showing multiple pictures and we have picture one, two, and three, we should be aware and be cautious and just make sure to also erase picture one and two and three, unless we ever want to keep pictures around. But most of the time, after you show them, you want to delete them. Now let's move on to the next event command, which is set weather effects. Set weather effects allows us to change the weather on our map. When we select it, we can see that there are choices for the weather, and if we select a weather, we can also then adjust the strength of that weather, and we also have the ability to fade in this weather over time. The weather options here are none for clear weather, and then rain, storm, and snow. Let's adjust the power of our weather here too, so if we make this nine, we can have this be a strong rain. There is a noticeable difference between the lower power and higher power weathers. So for our testing, let's make the time zero so it's an instant weather change, but let's copy this and then make it so our friend over here also updates the weather. Let's paste this in and then instead of strength nine, let's just go with a lower value like strength two. So when we talk to him, he will also set the weather, but to a weaker rain. So right now it's a beautiful clear day out, but when we talk to our older friend here, it should change to weather rain. Wow, look at that, it's quite rainy out. So this is rain of strength nine, the highest strength. Now let's talk to our other friend here and let's see what a lower strength rain looks like. Ah, it's still rainy, but it's not nearly as dark out. Look at that. So that's pretty cool to be able to control the weather from events. For full disclosure though, there is a better way to control the weather on our maps, which we'll cover in a future tutorial when we look into map metadata. It gives us access to more weather effects too, such as sandstorm. For that reason, I basically have never used the set weather effects event command. I have definitely used the next event command in the list, which is play BGM. What play BGM does is play music. 
BGM stands for Background Music. This event uses music from our game's Audio BGM folder. When we select Play BGM, we can see the full list of audio files that are in our game's BGM folder. Let's select something cool like Game Corner. At any time, we can press Play in the top right to listen to a preview of the song. Ooh, it's kind of poppin'. And then we can press Stop to stop that audio preview. We can also choose to adjust the volume or the pitch. Let's make sure these are both at their default values, which are 100. And then let's hit OK. So when we talk to our friend here, it should change the currently playing music on our map. Let's talk to him and listen to that new BGM. So right now it's playing Route 1, but after this text command, it should change to Game Corner. Ooh, listen to that. That's kind of snazzy. After changing BGM, if we ever leave the map and come back from either a map transfer or from walking over a map connection, the BGM will reset back to the default BGM that was defined in the map's BGM settings. In the future, I plan on doing a full tutorial on how to add new music in here, but it's pretty straightforward if you want to add new audio files into your game's audio BGM folder. As a warning though, if the file is a large MP3, it may not play in your game. I recommend using OGG audio files instead, but we can get more into that in the future tutorial. Let's look at the next event command now, which is Fade Out BGM. Fade Out BGM does exactly what it sounds like it does. It fades out our currently playing BGM over a period of time. When we select the command, we can see that the only option is how many seconds we want the fade out to take. The lowest value that we could possibly set here is 1, and the highest value that we can use is 60 if you want that fade out to take a minute. Let's just use 1 second though. For our example event, let's make it so that way it changes the BGM to the game corner, and then let's insert a wait here of 20 frames, so we get to listen to it for a second, and then let's fade it out over a second, and then also wait a second. Let's see how this sounds in game. Let's listen to that audio play and then fade out. Hello. And wouldn't you know it, just like that, the audio faded out, and now it's quiet on this map. Ah, peace and silence. Now let's look at the next event commands, which are play BGS and fade out BGS. What play BGS and fade out BGS do are the exact same as we just covered for the BGM commands, but for BGS instead. BGS is background sounds, so think of them as long sound effect music tracks such as rain sounds. These live in our game's audio BGS folder. BGS can play at the same time as BGM, so we can get a nice sounding overlay of sound effects with the music. I almost never use BGS, and by default, the folder itself is empty, but for an example, let's plug in some rain sound effects that I downloaded earlier to use for testing. A download link for these rain sound effects will be made available in the video description. Just like with our BGM, we could also choose to play and stop the preview, as well as adjust the volume and the pitch. Let's hit OK here and see how these BGS sound in-game. When we talk to our friend, we should hear BGS start playing. Oh, listen to that! It's rain sound effects! That's pretty nice! One thing that's important though, one thing you really need to be mindful of when using BGS, is that most maps don't have BGS overrides set in their map settings. So, if you ever transfer the player to another map, or if you walk over a map connection, the BGS will continue playing, even though we're on a different map with different music. Going into the map settings and setting auto-change BGS to none will also not address this issue. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work. The only things you can do are ensure to fade out BGS on your new map or during the player transfer, or set your map BGS override to an existing BGS with the volume cranked all the way down to zero. And if we ever wanted to fade out our BGS, we would just use that next event command in the list, which is fade out BGS, and we can fade it out over the course of a couple seconds if we want. That about does it for BGS though. Let's look at the next event commands. These are memorize BGM slash BGS and restore BGM slash BGS. These are a two-piece combo where we first want to call Memorize, and then later call Restore. What Memorize does is take a snapshot of which BGM and BGS files are currently playing, as well as their volume and pitch. Then what Restore does is stop whatever BGM and BGS files are currently playing, to then begin playing our BGM and BGS files that we memorized earlier, complete with their volume and pitch settings. This is a useful pairing of commands if we ever want to make a cutscene where we change the music or BGS during the event, and then we want to make the music go back to what it used to be when the event ends. Let's set up an example event. First, let's call Memorize BGM BGS, and let's call that towards the top of the event. I would recommend calling Memorize near the top of the event, so we're saving the map's default BGM and BGS going in. 
And then what we can do is we can call restore at the very end. And then in the middle, let's actually do a play BGM where we're changing our BGM. Let's play something like Hall of Fame. Okay, that's kind of cool. And then let's also do a play BGS here. Let's play our rain and let's crank up the volume even. And then let's give it a wait. Let's wait maybe 60 frames. And then at the end, let's restore BGM slash BGS. When we're talking to our friend here, it memorizes BGM and BGS at the start, and then it's changing it. And there we go. So it played the new BGM and the rain BGS, and then after 60 frames, it chose to restore what it was at the start when we did memorize. Let's do it again. Let's give it another listen. Hello, I'm an event. There we go. This is because at the very start when we did memorize, our BGM is root one, and we have no BGS playing. So this is pretty useful. Next up are play ME and play SE. What play ME and play SE do are play sounds, the ME and SE files in our game's audio, ME and SE folders respectively. The difference between them is that SE are standard sound effects that can be played at the same time as our BGM, but ME are special sound effects that will pause our currently playing BGM as they play. A good example for ME would be something like item get. Whenever we pick up an item, the music will stop and then continue playing once the item pickup ME finishes playing. A good example for SE would be something like, let's see, how about player bump? Whenever we walk into something in game, the bump SE will play, but we wouldn't want that to pause our music every time it played. Let's listen to both of these in game. I've cranked up the game music for this one. Let's talk to our old guy here. I've set up a show choices where we can listen to the item get ME or the bump SE. Let's listen to item get. As we can hear, it fades out the currently playing BGM and then plays the ME all the way through and then resumes the BGM. Let's listen to it one more time. That's pretty nice. Now let's listen to bump. As we can hear, it did not pause the music. In fact, we could actually just walk into an object and we could hear bump a lot there. The, the music will continue playing as an SE plays, but the music will stop when an ME plays. Next up is Stop SE. What Stop SE does is just stop whatever SE sound effect is currently playing. I hardly ever use this and most of the time sound effects are so short anyway that this doesn't really get much use. Now we're finally on to page three. You'll be pleased to know that we don't use most of the event commands on this page, since they are mostly tied to conventional RPG Maker data that we never use. To help drive my point home, I've now marked the event commands that we never ever use with a red overlay, and marked the event commands that we can use with a green overlay. That's a lot of red, eh? Well, I counted, and that's actually 24 out of 30. And four of these green commands are actually commands that I've never used in any of my games either. Just going down the list, the commands that we never use are Battle Processing, Shop Processing, Name Input Processing, Change HP, Change SP, Change State, Change EXP, Change Level, Change Parameters, Change Skills, Change Equipment, Change Actor Name, Change Actor Class, Change Actor Graphic, Change Enemy HP, Change Enemy SP, Change Enemy State, Enemy Recover All, Enemy Appearance, Enemy Transform, Show Battle Animation, Deal Damage, Force Action, and Abort Battle. Those can all be skipped. Now, let's look at the useful event commands here on page 3, the first of which is Recover All. I use Recover All a lot. What Recover All does is heal all of the Pokémon in your party, such as a Nurse Joy event in a Pokémon Center. When selecting Recover All, we can see that we have the option to heal the entire party or our player. This option doesn't really matter and is more of a leftover of us using RPG Maker. In other RPG Maker games, our party will have other characters in it, but in Pokemon Essentials games, our party is technically just the player, and our Pokemon party is instead determined by the Pokemon Essentials code and data. Whenever I use Recover All, I just select Entire Party, and now this will heal all of our Pokemon. Next up are a couple event commands that I've never used, but could still be useful. Call Menu Screen just opens the game's Menu Screen. Call Save Screen opens the game's Save Screen. I've never used either of these, but they could be useful in specific scenarios, in particular if we use Change Save Access and Change Menu Access to prohibit player menuing and saving, then these could be substitutes. Next up on the list is Game Over. What this does is trigger a blackout, as if we just lost a Pokémon battle, and then it warps us back to our healing spot, which is either back home or back to the last Pokémon Center. We'll talk all about blacking out and healing spots in a future tutorial, though. 
Next up is return to title screen. What this does is open up our game's title screen. It's a little bit jank though, and kind of not functional, so I would recommend avoiding this one. In my testing, I ran into issues when attempting to continue or start a new game, and it didn't really work out too well. And now for the grand finale, we saved the best for last, that is the script command. This one is probably the most important but most complex event command of all. This is what we would use to call script commands, which are more advanced commands that are defined in our game's script, which is the game's code. This is how we'll call a lot of Pokemon Essentials exclusive methods, such as adding or removing Pokemon from our party, or adding items to our bag. It's even possible to create your own script commands and call them from here, if you're into programming. If you're afraid of programming, don't worry though, we'll cover a lot of script command stuff in their own individual tutorials in the future. As an example, there will definitely be a tutorial revolving around adding and removing Pokemon, as well as items and trainer battles and so on. If you look at the events that exist in the base essentials maps, you'll probably see a lot of script commands being called. And that does it for our review of all the event commands. Thank you so much for sticking it out with me through this super long episode 5. If you learned something from this tutorial, please remember to like and subscribe! Seeing the positivity of the community really helps motivate me to work on the next tutorial too, so please let me know if you liked this tutorial in the comments below. To access my tutorial website, please check the link in the video description. As a reminder, this tutorial is for Pokemon Essentials V20, so if a newer version is released in the future, such as V21, it is possible that the layout or the functionality of some of the things that I mentioned could be changed. In general though, this series should get you to where you need to go when it comes to making your own Pokemon fan game. Thank you so much again for watching, I hope you learned something, and I hope that you have a good one. Best of luck to you in your Pokemon fan game endeavors. Bye now!